excuse me, I know I look tired, but it's late. It's probably, I don't know, 5, almost 6 a.m. And this is a typical night for me when I want to go to sleep, which might have been five or six hours ago. They give me a shot that keeps me awake. And then they'll give me a shot about 5 or 6 a.m. I just got one a short while ago on my arm that normally makes me tired. And the entire reason behind this is an attempt to keep me from being productive. They hope that I'll sleep the entire morning away. But that doesn't work all the time. Sometimes it does. It's a constant battle. But anyhow, picking up where I left off. So anyhow, after the doctor leaves, a psychiatrist comes in. And we go over a series of questions and just the events that happen. And he comes to the, he comes to the, the determination that I'm, I'm fine. And he thinks that I just need some rest. So he gives me an option to stay at the hospital for a couple of days. I say, yes, that's fine. Like in general, admission. So about an hour or so goes by and one of the nurses come back and she said, we don't have any room left like in the general space there's no room left she said we but we do have space available in the psych ward which is l1 and it's like uh i don't know the different categories of psych wards but this was probably like i don't know one of the lower tiers like not any real um things going on I actually found that quite a few vets go there when they need a break from life which is which was interesting to me um but anyhow it's called L1 so I'm like okay cool no big deal I'll take it so I go to L1 L1 is a something like a confinement like you can't have anything in there it's very um it's like secured in every way and um monitored for the most part these people are still able to see like there's nowhere that I can go that they don't exist as long as I have this chip so Anyhow, I get up day one, and, oh, well, no, that night, that night when I got there, because it was late, later in the day, anyhow, so that evening when I got there, I'm checking in, and as I'm sitting there, they put something in my water, the tides put something in my water, so I just left it set. But the that wasn't the worst part. These people put professionals in a position where they can lose their jobs. I'm talking about innocent individuals. The guy that was checking me in, I'm not going to say any. They gave this man something that made him super happy-go-lucky. I'm talking about like just giddy and giggly could not quite focus at all. And that's embarrassing for me to even say because obviously, you know how that goes, trace it back. And and the next time I saw him, he was completely different. And he was, um, I could tell, quite embarrassed. But he didn't know himself what happened. So, anyhow, I talked to, um, I talked to one of the counselors that day. 
and just kind of go over the series of events and some of my family history and just my history in general. And that's all a breeze the next day. Um, another counselor comes in because you go through a series of counselors and they all kind of, I guess they collect and um, collect, consolidate and compare notes for consistency. So since everything was consistent, they pretty much told me that they didn't have a reason. It not only was it a voluntary state on my part, which I started to think would be good because I'm like, okay, because I know these events sound bizarre. So let me go ahead and get mentally cleared out the way. But um, like I said, they couldn't find, they have to have a reason to justify you being there. And because they didn't have one, I was gone like in a few, in two days or so. Um, but one of the things that they asked me before I left was, could I still hear the individuals? And they did offer, um, I'm not sure what the name of the drug was, but they always offer you something. And I'm not one to medicate. So the entire time that this experience, this, this ordeal has been going on, the only thing that I've had is laxatives and one Tylenol PM. That's all I've had. And as I get into more of this story, you'll be able to connect the dots and identify where and why those things took place. But other than that, there was nothing. Um, so there's no reason. They can't justify keeping me. I'm mentally cleared. They didn't come up with a prognosis. He actually came up with, um, I think it's called... There's an actual term, but for now, we'll just call it unspecified. Um, so, yeah, it was unspecified. I mean, or not even up. Pretty much there was just nothing. The thing is, this is what happened. The male doctor that came in that day, and he went over everything that they did collectively. He, um... He pretty much said, you know, everything was fine as long as I wasn't hearing these people that everything was okay. Not even that everything was okay. He just wanted to make sure that it wasn't, that it didn't still exist. Of course, I told him no. And on top of that, I'm not about to let you label me with anything because I'm very in touch with reality. I'm not letting that happen. I'm not going to let anybody do that to me. So, he says, okay, great deal. Um, right now, I'm just going to put it down as something. And I rejected that. And I said, you don't have anything for, like, not being able to come up with anything. Like, do you have anything that you can say, like, that means that you don't have anything to call this? Because I'm not going to just let you label me. So that's how we came up with no prognosis or unspecified. And that was that. I cleared. Boom. I leave. When I leave here, I go back to Bellflower. And now I'm... I had already booked a flight to fly home the next day. Which would have been for the 13th. They're taunting me the entire way to the airport. Let me make sure there's no events that happen in between. There was a couple other things, but it's kind of irrelevant. But the entire time that I'm preparing to leave and get ready for this flight, they're still doing the same things, still targeting me in the same way, and still taunting me, telling me that what I'm going through here in California is nothing compared to what I'm going to be going through when I get home to Ohio because I don't have a clue what's going on with my family in Ohio. Because I don't have a clue of what's going on 
with my family in Ohio. And that they're in danger. The flight home was horrible. It was um, one of the worst flight experiences that I've ever had. And I had so many connecting flights. I don't know, probably two, maybe three. But flying under this type of scrutiny and these type of conditions, this type of hate crime was way too much. So anyhow, I make it home to Ohio and it's late. It's probably, I don't know, 11 or 12 midnight. And this is the 13th. My great aunt's funeral was the next day. My great aunt's funeral was the next day. I get home. <sighs> my dad and his friend pick me up from the airport. We get back to my mother's place. And we're outside and we're knocking for a nice little minute. But I have, she, they've been threatening, threatening me about my mom's death this entire time because they, pretty much what they were saying is that if something were to happen to me, she would not be able to take it. And they knew that if that killing me would result in killing her. Killing me will result in killing her. That had been part of all the other conversations for the last three or four days. So I get home and we're out here and we're knocking. And these people are telling, <laughs> not even these people, it's Keisha. Running off at the mouth like she normally does with all her Ill-mannered is an understatement with all of her filth. This girl says the most trifling, unpredictable things that you could think of. So she's telling me that my mother is upstairs stretched out on the floor. Upstairs, stretched out on the floor. Believable because, like I said, to me, for her to not answer her door is unknown. So what do I do? I panic. And I break a little, break the window so that we can get in. Unlike me. But you would do something like that, too, if you thought that someone you loved was in harm's way. So that's what happened. The first night I got home, I broke out my mother's window. Broke out my mother's window because I thought that she was in harm's way. Just to find out she was just sleep in a really, really deep sleep with the music loud. She had her music turned up upstairs. Sleep. Still all unusual. Still all very unusual. So anyhow, after all this simmers down, we're, we're at about, I don't know, my dad didn't stick around too long, but now we're at roughly, I don't know, 3 or 4 a.m. Her and I, like, just kind of catching up. Now, look, since I've been through all this stuff in California, I know exactly what it looks like on someone else. That whole smothering ordeal. Now, 
Let me tell you something. The mind can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And a closed mind is definitely an enemy. And a mind that's too open is an enemy. Therefore, you need balance. But back to this closed mind thing. When that, my mother was sitting there and we were talking and she, I could tell she was smothered. So I asked her, I tried to break it down in a way that she would understand it without telling her what happened, what happened to me. She has a series of illnesses or ailments. Lots of stuff. So hypertension being one. So she can't really take a whole lot. She can't even handle conversations surrounding certain matter matters. So I wasn't going there. I wasn't going there. I, I just tell her enough for her to have an idea of what's going on. All the details involved in this situation, she does not know. Um. So... That happens, I try to break it down to her. She constantly denies it. But once again, I know what it looks like. And that's exactly what happened. Right after that happened, they made another attempt at killing me right there in front of my mother. And that went on for about two weeks into me being home. Now I'm gonna get into some more of this story because like I said, it just keeps evolving. All these matters, all these issues, all these problems with these people, with these ties, these threats of death keep evolving. But anyhow, she denied it and I digressed. So I'm up late. I'm exhausted. These people are still Attempting to harm me. The only thing they're not doing at this point is they're just, they're not tr they're no longer trying to remove my soul. So the attacks on my back have stopped for now. But like I said, this is probably three or four a.m. We're up talking and catching up and just going over some things that have taken place and I missed my great aunt's funeral now the issue that I have with that is I support everyone and I hated that I couldn't be there for those family members but they didn't know they didn't have a clue what I was going through they didn't have a clue what was going on with this situation. So now maybe they'll understand. And I don't think that there's a grudge there anyhow. So it just happens to work out. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes some folks have more understanding than others. But I really do apologize for that. Because that bothered me. And these people... They don't give a fuck either way it goes. <laughs>